Welcome to the second episode of Join the Dots, looking specifically at food. This episode, more than the ones we've done to date, really demonstrates the ethos of why we started this podcast. What are the consequences of the choices we make and the actions we take? To help us delve into this subject in more detail, we have with us Professor Bridget Emmett. Bridget, would you like to introduce yourself and your expertise and interests? Hello, great to be with you today. I'm a, an environmental scientist who's worked on issues such as air pollution, climate change and land use for over 30 years now. I'm interested in how these issues impact on our environment, but more importantly, to help governments, people, agencies think about new ways of managing our systems so that we have the food we need to be healthy, but without leaving behind a damaged environment for our children and our grandchildren. Food is one of life's greatest pleasures, deeply reflective of our cultural values, but also deeply political. Michael Pollan, a food journalist at UC Berkeley, tells us the secret to eating well is eat food, not a lot, mostly from plants. Although food systems currently produce about twice the calories needed to feed the world, both quantity and quality are unequally distributed. Billions of people suffer from either malnutrition or obesity. The Eat Lancet Commission proposed a detailed diet to achieve planetary healthy diets for nearly 10 billion people by 2050. But other researchers point out that the Eat Lancet diet exceeded household per capita income for at least one and a half billion people. The Eat Lancet diet is also more expensive than the minimum cost of nutrient adequacy, often by a significant factor. Marion Nesley, a professor of nutrition, food studies, and public health at New York University, tells us diets that promote human health are largely, but not necessarily entirely, plant-based, provide adequate but not excessive calories, and minimize or avoid ultra-processed foods. Such diets are also better for the environment. I'm looking at this World Bank data, iworldindata.org, and it tells you about diet compositions in each country. And a quarter of the calories in a day comes from wheat. But there is a relationship between the share of calories from animal protein versus the GDP per capita. That's gross domestic product. It's a measure of economic activity. So it says, actually, as the income goes up, the share of animal protein in diets increase. And since most countries want to grow their GDP, if that trend holds, we will see higher use of animal protein for feeding an increasing population in the world. So if that's the reality, despite all the advice that we're being given about eating more plant-based food, where does that leave us in terms of consequences for the environment and society? I think we know from so many assessments that we are damaging the environment. We know we're not meeting our greenhouse gas targets. Water quality is an issue. And I have a particular thing about soil. Only 30% of this planet is land. And of this, 55% is used to grow food. So that means only 15% of the planet is all we've got to grow all our food. And when we say land, we really mean soil. And soil is really, really slow to be formed over time. Roughly one inch of topsoil that we would use for growing our crops or the grass that animals eat can take several hundred years or more to develop. So that's just one example of how unsustainable our current system is. We really need to change something for our water, our soils, our air quality and for our biodiversity. So what are the impacts of growing meat? So it is quite variable. Some animals are growing in extensive systems and they have relatively low impacts on water and soil. But any animal that's ruminant, which is where they've got this gut flora that basically creates greenhouse gas emissions, particularly methane, however many animals you have, you will be contributing to climate change. On top of that, industries such as dairy really have an impact on water quality and on the soils they have. So it's like each sector has a different impact on the environment. An upland sheep farm has a very different impact, as you can imagine, from an intensive lowly dairy farm. 
what does that mean in terms of the choices we make? If we want to eat, say, a little bit of meat occasionally, are there things that we ought to be considering that could minimise our impact on the environment? Yes, there's a lot of work going on in trying to get a footprint, as it's called. If you pick up a piece of meat in the supermarket, how do you know that that piece of meat has had less environmental impact? And it's quite confusing to do that from any of the labels that we have now. But I just want to add something else into the mix here. Our farming systems is part of our culture as well. So I live and work in Wales and the Upland sheep farm, you might think has a lower environmental impact, but also has lower productivity in terms of calories per area of land. But on the other hand, that land really can't be used for any other food production. It's just not of high enough quality. So if we say let's have less sheep farmers in the uplands to have fewer greenhouse gas emissions, what's going to happen to the culture? The Welsh language is very often embedded in that upland system. I mean, work we did for Welsh Gov said as we do these new trade deals, our upland sheep farming is really at risk. And it's not like we can then just switch it to growing plant-based products. That land just doesn't have the capability to do it. So we just need to remember that different land has different capability. We can't put food in isolation because actually it impacts, as you were saying, Jill, at the beginning, socially and culturally and economically. We've spent about an hour trying to find a way into this episode because it's just so complicated, right? And that puts everyone off and you just want to throw your hands in the air and say, I can't deal with this many different factors and I'm just one person trying to buy one meal and therefore I just reach to the thing that I always cook. But there must be areas of study that approach such complex problems in a more organised way. Can you just give me some hope that that is the case? Yeah, so a way of doing it is by thinking of it as a whole system. So you can go and look at what have we got now? If this changes, what will that mean in terms of land use, in animal numbers? And then what do those animals do in terms of climate change, water quality, air quality, but also those aspects such as jobs and culture and language? And so we put all of those together and create a spider's web of connections and dependencies. One of the examples, if we reduce our meat production, if we don't change our diet, we just export that production to another country. So you're just not getting any net benefit. You're talking about a very top-down sort of analysis. And often the people we're talking to are thinking from the bottom up. But it's the same sort of systems approach. I'm thinking about the sort of diet I have compared to the food that my parents used to provide and also the food that my daughter and her family eat. And actually, you can see that there is a big shift in generations. I mean, when I was little, yogurt was exotic. (laughs) Pizza, what's that? That's foreign food. We do change over time. And I'm just wondering whether we can start to encourage choices that are more respectful of the environment whilst recognising the social implications of those. That is right. There's a constant change going on without any involvement of government or what have you. It has happened as we've had global access to food markets. So governments have been trying to make us do things for years and sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't. But we also know that a huge number of people have become vegan. And trying to unpick why that's happened, because government didn't push people, they've made their own choices to do that. And you can actually put that into the scenario. What are the consequences? What are the benefits for health? But also, what are the benefits for the environment? Because some of the products that vegans dip into are sourced globally all around the world that we might or might not fully understand what their environmental impact is. So if we all continue to eat meat the way that we're eating and as countries get richer, they increase their meat intake, does that mean that we're going to have a lot of intensive cattle farms with consequences for animal welfare, pollution, perhaps impact on nutrition, and then only large farms can survive? And there might be automated, there might be less jobs, and we might have to import feed Are there any solutions to that scenario? I suppose the question is, would we be better to have fewer animals but spread over more areas? Or are you better to concentrate those animals in housing 
which on the one hand you can then control the emissions feedstocks and that means there's more land available for nature for biodiversity then you have the whole issues about animal welfare we've got to make that decision hmm. These discussions are also raging when we talk about how we grow our crops. There's the argument that organic growing will damage less birds and insects. However, the yields are lower. And I think some people would argue with the degradation of land, with the increasing population, it may not even be a choice that we have to go down the more extensive systems. I mean, a lot of the payments to farmers have been to de-intensify so that you will have environmental gain. But will we be able to grow enough food? That links to what you were saying at the beginning, Bridget. We're using limited amount of land, so you want to get as much out of that land as possible using technology with minimal environmental impact. I just want to point out that as we're making the argument for maximizing yields, that should not be an argument for anything goes. As Bridget pointed out, soil loss is a severe concern. We also have to think about what we can grow in the next generation. It's the same for pesticide use. It needs to be judicious. We don't want to wipe out our pollinators or damage our birds. So even if we go along the more intensive route of land sparing, we need to think about what practices we're allowing there's quite a steep curve getting to a point where you grow more food more intensely without unintended consequences. You know, the whole GMO debate came up. We've got vertical farming ideas. One farmer who's doing, say, beef farming to move into arable, that's a whole shift in the machinery they need, the skills they need. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. So are there any technological solutions? You mentioned vertical farms. What can you grow vertically? The opportunity for vertical farming is quite exciting, but I suspect it's going to be limited to certain crops that don't require huge amounts of space. And I think those four species, mm. that isn't going to happen. But there are some things which we have a lot of wastage in because they go off very quickly. So salad crops, herbs, that are really important for vitamins and minerals. I can imagine supermarkets having their vertical farming in the car park and every day they go and bring in the next lot of herbs and the wastage and the transport costs would go down. That to me is one of the benefits if we can get the technology right. I want to talk GMO a little bit because there's a lot of desire to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's a big difference between GMO to allow plants to be maybe more resilient to climate change and GMO that allows you to dump more pesticides in the field. And part of the issue is the profit driver when agribusiness is driving GMO research. Do you have any thoughts on that? I agree with you, Sabina. I think the lack of uptake and acceptability is in part the perception about why it's being done and for whose benefit. Some of the developments that perhaps increase vitamin levels or mineral levels, you know, that might help avoid some deficiencies, people might be more accepting of that than a development that just allows a, a less considered way of farming. And perhaps we didn't get the communication right. I don't want to tell anyone they should or shouldn't buy GMO crops. Is it throwing baby out with bathwater? Probably. There's real potential there. How do we make sure it's the potential that we can use safely and that people will accept? We all have quite a power as consumers because if people suddenly want to buy A and not B, the industry will change. And I think that's the power that we all don't think we have. And yet just look at the vegan thing and that whole vegan section. Where was that five, ten years ago? And yet suddenly the supermarkets and the growers have all responded to that consumer pool. We also as individuals have power on who we vote for, which campaigns we join. A few years ago, there was a recommendation from Committee on Climate Change that food security would become a more important issue in the future especially with climate change risks manifesting themselves differently across the globe and because we are importing half of our food. 
and the reaction from the government was that food security wasn't something that the government should focus on and it was a matter for the markets to sort themselves out it, uh, taking what what you said about consumer power to its extreme that we can just dictate what's produced where and where it's sold by demand and supply alone but i think governments are changing their views about responsibilities and risks and policies all the time a lot of food journalists or food activists consider the market as the driver of food policy one of the problems within the food system and invoke corporate capture and the profit incentive of selling us lots of cheap ultra processed foods as the bulk of our calories and markets are amoral we can't count on markets always delivering what we need so I think that's really interesting because there's a principle that's called the polluter pays. So if you do a release of a chemical into a river, you are fine to help clear that up. You could start thinking about that with diets in the market. That drive for cheap, unhealthy food is actually causing consequences. And you could think of it as a pollution tax. It's a health tax. There is a role for government here because the planet is becoming unstable, but also health-wise, this isn't sustainable. I really like that analogy because right now we allow people to profit from the benefits, but we carry the environmental and the health costs. And that is a broken system. We need to be careful, though. I mean, we had lots of discussions about sugar tax. And that could be a very regressive tax. The intention was to reduce excessive use of sugar in processed foods. The practice could easily be companies just passing on the tax burden to the consumer and making things that are processed a bit more expensive for people who feel they can't afford unprocessed, more natural alternatives. We often think of governments as regulation and taxes. But there are also incentives and, of course, education. Government actually has quite a lot of roots in or levers to pull. We've got to find a middle ground where it's just not the market and consumer and we all act as individuals. Top down, there's a sweet spot in the middle somewhere that we're trying to get at, perhaps. So we talked about the incentives and I hate to bring it back to the UK, but we're a month away from Brexit and... To me, the only possibly good thing about Brexit is we will change the way that common agricultural policy worked. And that paid for production much more than it paid for environmentally beneficial management. I'm not sure I would agree that the cap was food subsidy. For many years now, every country had to submit what the payments were to deliver. And that might be cultural protection, language, it could be environmental or what have you. So actually for quite a while, the payments have been for environmental benefits. It was called Pillar 2. Mm. But in the UK, it was 3 billion versus 300 million for Pillar 2. So there was room for um, reform. So what will Welsh government do after CAP? They are going to develop something called the Sustainable Farm Scheme, which thinks about both the environmental consequences, but also try to get the farm businesses more robust and resilient. We often think about sustainability with an environment hat on, but also we should think about it socially and economically. So how can we create a farm system in the round, including environment, but also making you more adaptable, flexible to changing climate risk, to changing markets, diversify so that it's not lamb or nothing. That's the approach they're doing in Wales. In England, it's about public goods, which is a similar approach without thinking about the farm as a whole living system. I've read if there's no trade agreement that sheep meat from somewhere else is going to flood the market and it's going to decimate the sheep farming in Wales. Is that true? Yeah, so we estimated about 3 million reduction in sheep. That's a 30% cut in the sheep market. Could happen under some deals like no deal or multi-free trade agreement deal. Dairy, though, could expand because of a reduction of the cap on milk and beef would be kind of in the middle. So that's when we started doing that approach of the spider's web that I was talking about. So, OK, less sheep farmers in the uplands and those farmers don't have many options of what they can move into. And so the projection was that land might just come out of agriculture. 7,000 loss of jobs, 
we like the rolling hills of Wales? Do we want them covered in trees? Some people do, some people don't. Who makes the decision? And who finds jobs for those 7,000 yeah. jobs in farming? Because they're not going to become foresters overnight, right? You said about sheep farms mostly exporting, and I heard we produce a lot of lamb in the UK, but it all goes somewhere else, and then we buy lamb from somewhere else. What's that? We tend to like what they call heavy lamb. So we get lamb in from New Zealand, and we export our lamb to places like France who like what we produce in our uplands, which is called light lamb. So they're very dependent on the export, and that's where these trade deals are going to impact on them. So how do we know that we like heavy lamb rather than light lamb? I didn't know we did. If it's just what's available in the supermarket, Greece likes our lamb. Why don't we like our lamb? Do we even try and eat it? I mean, I think people will just pick a lamb joint up. You know, it's meatier, it's less bone, easier to cut. Is it cheaper by any chance? And it's cheaper. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, it's only cheaper because the price doesn't include anything about how far the, that lamb has to travel. Well, some of our lamb is on the good quality lowland and a lot is on the upland. And that land can't support the sheer quantity of sheep production that, say, they can in New Zealand. Um, do you want to support your local Welsh farmer? But it might well be more expensive. And remember, it's more expensive even with the European payments to the farmers. In the back of my head, I always imagine that when I eat my local grass-fed lamb, it won't have that disproportionate carbon footprint. How much is that a correct assumption? Sometimes very efficient, productive farms actually have lower greenhouse gas footprints because they run a tight ship. I watched quite a lot of food programs recently, and, and the messaging from that was industrial farms were always bad. But I'm hearing something new for me. You can't think of these in isolation. Yes, aesthetically, they may be more pleasing. They may be better for animal welfare. But looking at the whole system, the conclusions might be surprising. There's often sort of a Garden of Eden thing where we think if we just go back to the good old days, that everything will be all right. And we ignore some of the things that might have been unjust or impactful in those. We think back to the old days with these rose-tinted spectacles. There was rural poverty. There was famine. You know, the farmers have done an amazing job. After the war, they were told, feed the nation. And they did it. And we now just need to step back and think, OK, you used a lot of steel to plow the land, a lot of fertilizers. And we split the sectors, you know, livestock over there, arable over there, those mixed systems we lost. We need to rethink that. We need to find biological solutions, not always chemical and steel. We need to work with nature, not just against it. And we need to have more mixed systems so that we have greater resilience to disease and we look after our soil better. And with all the knowledge that we've now got, can we do some of those things, but in a better 21st century way? Of course, we shouldn't forget that the partition of land were part of what caused the problems and the famines as well, that there were winners and losers in that equation. And of course, it's not just in the past, is it? Not everywhere has this historical change that you described, Bridget. And I'm very conscious of my privileges. But also, as a middle class person, I have responsibility. If I don't make these more environmentally friendly, more socially equitable choices, how are these brands going to become cheaper for everyone else to use? And there are lots of calculators. There's one on the BBC website. They look at dairy, rice, soy, oat and almond milk, how much carbon emissions there are, how much land use and how much water use. Dairy seems to come out worse and the others compare differently depending on which of the three you're looking at. What's your takes on which milk to drink? I'm quite interested that there isn't that biodiversity angle because I think there's some concerns with the almond milk about the pollinators that are moved from orchard to orchard. That might be where the stress comes in that gets those viruses that have really impacted on some of our bee population. I mean, oats we can grow in this country. So most of the world's almonds come from California, right? And basically there aren't enough bees to pollinate all the almonds that California is growing. So they transport hives of bees from one orchard to the other 
to do the pollination. Now, I don't know how bees feel about this. Because they're highly social animals and that shifting, you know, it's like us moving our home. Right. How would you feel about that? So that stress has allowed some of these viruses and disease into the system, which gets out from those populations into the wild populations. So that assessment doesn't include that, you see. It just looks at uh, carbon, land and water. I should point out moving colonies is not unique to almond growth in North America, but that's true for a lot of their pollinated monocultures. That reminds me of something Jill said, actually, at the um, end of the COVID PPE episode, that the way that we use natural environments is going to make this kind of pandemic more likely. And I think the conversation about things spreading in the bee population and down to wild populations is reminiscent of that. And David Attenborough came out and did, a, th- did that documentary after you, Jill. Have you been advising him? Well, clearly I should be. (laughs) Yeah, I think there's another issue here. With our dairy industry, there's loads of websites about they're actually very social animals. Those calves have to go somewhere. And a lot now are shot because it's not even economic to grow them on into beef. And yet we just happily drink our dairy. And I personally adore cheese. And yet it's interesting the microscope that the almond milk and bees are put under because it's new to our psyche. Anything new is immediately more risky. But there's absolutely no discussion on where these things are grown, you know, as well. Almond is grown in California, it's surrounded by desert, isn't it? I mean, I don't like almond milk, but I really like oat milk, which a girlfriend recommended. And I think I could live with it. And Bridget said we grow oat. Yeah. yeah, we grow oats here, don't we? Absolutely. And it seems to be less processed. Here I go again. You can actually make oat milk pretty easily at home if you want. Our very own Nigella Lawson. Yes. <laughs> I'll be telling you to grow the oats next. <laughs> yeah, in my windowsill. Okay, before we wrap up this episode, is there anything you'd like to say, Bridget? Treating food in isolation from health from our jobs and from our culture. We have to do it because you're in the shop and you want to buy something. But I think we need to remember that food is part of who we are and hopefully things will become a bit simpler for us all. But absolutely, the overall messages of more plant-based, less meat, it's going to be good for your health. Thinking beyond the immediate food boundary is just something else that I would help us all to think about. So we've learned this isn't, as we suspected, a simple issue, that farmers are not the enemy, but they do need our help moving to the right means of producing our food. It's difficult as everyday punters to make the right choices. We may, in the short term at least, have to pick our priority issue. Is it climate change, animal welfare, livelihoods and communities, human rights, biodiversity, And some of the choices we make will impact on those other issues. There are some brands that are going to make some of these choices easier for us. Those of us who can afford to ought to be using our purchasing power to make those more affordable for others. And we also worry about greenwash, and I suspect is the topic for another episode of this. This is not a static issue. The information that we're getting and our understanding of impacts is changing all the time. And I think that we will be coming back to this issue. But in the meantime, I think it's up to all of us to think about the issues, look at the labels, consider the impact.